All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the 21st Talks podcast. My name is Colin Snell. This is episode 19, where I got the chance to interview Tobias Bauman. Tobias is a co-founder of the Center for Reducing Suffering, which is a research center that focuses on creating a future with less suffering in it, taking all sentient beings into account. He's also the recent author of a new book called Avoiding the Worst, How to Prevent a Moral Catastrophe, where he lays out the concept of future suffering risks, or S-risks which is going to be a little confusing in the interview, no doubt, of course, because the overlap with X risk and S risks. But nonetheless, an S risk is just a suffering risk related to potential bad states where there's a lot of suffering happening in the future. His research has also focused on cooperative artificial intelligence, which he did at the University of College London. So thank you very much to Bias, and I am really, really excited to talk more about S risks in the future. Welcome to episode 19 of the 21st Talks podcast. What are the forces, challenges, and ideas that define the 21st century? Conversations to understand the greatest figures and stories of today to create a better tomorrow. This is the 21st Talks podcast. Can you go ahead and break down for our listeners like what work you do? Sure. Um, so I'm a, a researcher at the and the co-founder of the Center for Reducing Suffering, which is a um, research organization that broadly is trying to answer the question of how we can best reduce suffering. Um, so this has also been termed cost prioritization within the effective altruism community. So the question is like, rather than, rather than trying to directly do something to improve the world, like you're working on the question of like, you know, first figuring out how, how to most effectively uh, improve the world, which is um, certainly a very non, non-trivial uh, question that requires, you know, careful thought because, um, yeah, lots of people maybe tend to pick a certain cause and then, then stick with it or, or jump to certain conclusions where like at CRS, we tend to think more along the lines of the future being very uncertain um, and the consequences of our, of our actions are subject to um, great uncertainty, especially if we do, if we take into account all sentient beings, like including animals, possibly even future digital minds or something like that. Uh, and if we, um, take into account the consequences on the long-term future. Um, so these are, mm. of course, also philosophical issues. I, I don't know if we can go into that, but I, I quite oh, strongly... Oh, no, we absolutely should. I'd love that. <laughs> yeah, I, I, mean, I quite firmly b- believe that, you know, suffering matters uh, irresponsive, uh, regardless of a being's uh, species membership or when it happens. So like suffering in mm. 500 years' time is like, if we can do something now to prevent it, that's just as important as helping others in the here and now. Mm. Um, how, how is that generally received when you, when you are, are talking with folks about it? And maybe not necessarily just folks within the effective altruism community, but um, perhaps like, like ethicists. Does it seem like something that generally within um, other intellectual circles, there's this awareness of future suffering and a weighing of future suffering in a similar way to how um, many of the, the thinkers in the effective altruism movement do it? That's that's a good question. Um, I mean, I suppose we all live a little bit in our own bubble and in the sort of bubble that I live in, um, maybe that statement about, uh, you know, how future individuals matter just as much as present ones is taken to be, a, you know, a no-brainer, basically. Yeah, um, yeah. Whereas in, in the broader world, people um, might disagree, although I'm not sure if they disagree on, like, uh, like rigorous philosophical terms. Like if you just mm-hmm. post that as a, as a thought experiment, like uh, the suffering of one person now versus the suffering of two people in 200 years, if you have to decide between that, you know, then, you know, why would the time matter? You know, basically yeah. the yeah. question. Um, and there, there's generally again, that future discounting, right? Like there's generally the future discounting that people apply to, to future suffering. Or are, are you saying that it the, seems the, like from um, your experience, it's less intense? 
I mean, I, I think the the complicated thing about this is that you got to distinguish between the, the normative side and the empirical side, right? So one yeah. question is like whether you think that the, the suffering uh, is less important in the future or that future beings matter less, or you could think that, um, well, they matter equally, but um, what can we do now to help people 500 years down the line? Maybe that... You, so that could be a, a that, yeah, I mean, I think that actually is perhaps a good reason to be somewhat skeptical about the, the about long termism. Um, mm. I, I have written a bit about uh, that too. I, I mean, I'm not saying that one should, you know, uncritically accept this idea that the long term future um, is overwhelmingly more important than the present. Um, this is not really mm. what I'm saying. But on that purely normative side, uh, that future individuals matter just as much, you know, that I would say I, I am committing to that. So that that's yeah, that's a that's a very important delineation to draw. Uh, and as as sort of a brief overview of the intellectual background I'm coming from is um, like predominantly moral psychology and uh, like motivational sciences. Um, with uh, also studies of like ethics behind that. Um, like I, I'm really, really interested in what makes people do good and that pro-social behavior, both evolutionarily, but importantly, uh, fostering in the world today. Um, so it's, it's, it is really, really interesting to think about this, you know, these issues of different cognitive biases affecting how people think about doing good, which obviously since you're thinking about sort of the meta, like, you know, the biggest uh, kind of, um, I guess, like framework possible in the sense of um, thinking about how to even think about doing good. Uh, those cognitive biases are like potentially a lot more significant or a lot more um, apparent, right? Um, so in that, yes. I know you have a section on that in your book. Do you want to talk a little bit about the, those cognitive biases since it's like one of my favorite subjects? Um, yeah, definitely. Like so the section on cognitive biases in my book is about S risks in particular. Um, so mm. Asterisks. I mean, I suppose we're going to get into that later, but broadly, our worst case scenarios in the future that involve a lot of suffering. Mm -hmm. And then um, there, that sort of triggers certain cognitive biases. I mean, I think it's quite plausible that these biases are quite strong. So things like wishful thinking, you know, since we don't wish for that to happen, you know, we, we might tend to believe that it's that is not likely or, or that we can't do anything about it or, or something of the sort. Um, I mean, there's actually a lot of literature. Uh, there's a, a book by a guy called Cohen or so uh, about um, denial and this tendency to deny bad things that are going on, which is happening, mm. you know, throughout human history. People, you know, are just sort of um, uh, ignoring atrocities that are going on and just looking away and acting as yeah. if it didn't, didn't there. Um, and a sort of similar thing might happen too when it comes to bad future scenarios we just you know pretend that that's that's not a thing maybe and that's why we're we're ignoring it and of course the, an additional problem here is like the very abstract nature of this um so it's um you you talked earlier about um audiences outside of effective altruism and it can of course be quite difficult to explain the the ideas that i'm outlining in the book to you know the average person on the street, uh, I guess I would maybe maybe struggle to explain it there. Although I, I was trying to make the book uh, at least you know somewhat accessible uh, as mm. an introduction to the topic. So break down in in more depth. I mean the, this concept of S, like S risks, right? Um, what are some examples of what some of these world scenarios might look like? They're the worst possible uh, situation that we could find ourselves in. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so giving uh, specific examples can be um, quite tricky here, because um, what I would say is that like any specific example will probably inevitably fa sound a bit far fetched or like too specific mm. and therefore unlikely, um, and implausible, I mean, mm. implausible, exactly. And like the uh, what I would worry most about is, is you know, things that we, we, we can't realistically foresee or imagine uh, at this point, mm -hmm. unknowns that of, about how the future might go very, very badly. Um, mm -hmm. But, I mean, of course, uh, people want some sort of example. Um, I suppose some uh, episodes of Black Mirror uh, would uh, come to mind. And <laughs> yeah. That. 
Um, yeah. Uh, it's uh, hard to, to, to say like how plausible those scenarios are. Like I'm, I think what I'm thinking mm. about are like this episodes where, for instance, you can create lots of uploaded minds and then uh, torture them for long subjective periods of time, that sort of mm. stuff, you know, and you do sort I've of heard- notice that we like naturally tend to flinch away a little bit from like describing those things in, in, in too much detail because it's not a very... Mm. Uh, pleasant uh, conversation perhaps but nevertheless you know important mm. for someone to, to think about it i would say yeah absolutely no m- most certainly a very important one and i feel like a lot of that sort of knee-jerk reaction that folks might have to thinking about some of these topics is not dissimilar to what we were talking about earlier of this like general tendency of of um like wishful thinking um that we also see in like existential risk work right um especially within communication about existential risk it wasn't until Uh, Actually, I mean, I would argue it wasn't until COVID, as well as um, increases in, um, you know, the tempo of impact by climate change, um, that people, at least in in areas where like I was talking about climate change or pandemics or other existential hazards, coming from from an extras background, it wasn't until those experiences sort of like touched closer to home that people were much less likely to shy away from it. Now, I might have also just gone like better at talking about it. Maybe this is like the, maybe the, there's a, a personal foot here, right? Um, but like now it's now you, you you see it everywhere, right? Like I uh, I'm currently finishing up my undergrad. Um, I'll go uh, to a friend's place for a birthday party or something, uh, and like people will be talking about climate change to some degree or another hazard facing the world. And now the context people are talking about it in are very much so in these very doomsday like scenario contexts right this this general sense of of well the world's kind of like like effed so like we're gonna like like we might as well just like figure out and like get you know get out with a bag of money now sort of thing in terms of people going into like yeah. finance or law or something like that whereas like i know that's not actually what they feel that's kind of like the social like ramification of it but even more people now today are like are genuinely looking at these issues and going okay, this is a bad straight that we're in. Like, what can we do, right? And I, I feel like these like thought experiments and these conversations can help motivate that. So like, that's one of the like, missions we have here at 21st Stocks is like trying to take that like awareness of something really, really bad um, that is now kind of people, many people are moving away from that like virtual thinking, um, at least in some contexts and, and kind of like trying to leverage it to make sure that, that people can get in these positions um, and into these career paths where they can have the biggest impact they can. Yeah. Uh, and um, yeah. I mean, it's worth noting, though, that like biases can also cut both ways, you know. Uh, so maybe there's wishful thinking or denial going on, but, you know, maybe it also works the other way. And like we just tend to find it more exciting to discuss like relatively uh, speculative, extreme, distant scenarios in the future, you know. Mm. And like, maybe it's most likely that the future will be, you know, average or like have some good and some bad aspects rather than those more extreme scenarios that that people tend to think about that are more exciting to think about. So like there can be biases yeah. cutting ways and it's kind of often hard to, to tell like which biases are going to be stronger. Although I think mm. the tendency to, to, to flinch away from unpleasant thoughts and to do, to engage in visual thinking there, I think that is a quite strong bias, um, mm. and quite well supported in the literature, but yeah. 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 Most, most certainly. Uh, so can you break down like in, in more detail th- this concept of S risk? Can you like define it a little bit uh, more intense and then also or more intensely? And then um, after that, I was thinking it would be fun to uh, go through some of the questions that are really major, like large questions in this area um, of S risks and kind of work through them a little bit. Uh, allow me to pick your brain a little bit and some of the biggest questions facing uh, facing your field right now. Sure, sounds good. So the definition of asterisks, um, I would say that broadly speaking, an asterisk is um, a worst case future that involves a, a very large astronomical quantity of suffering that vastly exceeds uh, the levels of suffering that we've seen so far. Mm. Um, now, there, there are some technicalities here, like, uh, for instance, the question of, you know, how large does it really have to be? Um, Personally, I think that that question is just maybe not particularly interesting. I mean, obviously, the, the more suffering, the worse it is. So it's like a gradual concept. And like, I don't know if it makes sense to, to discuss like what the specific cutoff is, but we're talking about. <laughs> and, yeah. 
uh, people use this term uh, astronomical to to also like uh, that that points at the possibility that it doesn't happen just on Earth, but like throughout the universe, which would possibly result in much much larger quantities of suffering, just because there are so many uh, galaxies and stars in the universe. So so that mm. that's one one aspect of this. Um, then there are also some technicalities around like. Uh, is does the term S risk refer to the, the risk of this materializing or like, or like the materialization of that risk and so on? But like, you know, I think broadly it's getting clear what we're talking about. So yeah. Mm. Yeah. No. <laughs> so specifically before we like move into some of the questions that um, are the most intriguing to you in this, um, in, in a sub discipline subfield, um, I'm curious. So there's these conversations about, you know, uh, intergalactic or, you know, large scale, um, like interplanetary, uh, suffering scenarios, they're the worst possible. Are there also scenarios then that apply strictly just to earth? And when you are trying to make the se- like, make sense between the two of them, given the uncertainties about the future of, of space travel, especially, um, and we're not to talk about NASA's funding for the next 10 years. We're talking like, you know, in the sense of like, can we achieve a high enough velocity in space to like realistically get farther away, like far away from earth. Right. Um, things like that. Yeah. I like, think this how, is how do you make sense of those two different sets of, of problems? Because it's like, that's, you know, I, I think Isaac Asimov like makes a compelling point of like civilizations that are so potentially vast and ever expanding that like the amount of like speed that it takes to get one, from one end of it to the other is like on par with like thousands of years of travel. Right. Um, so like the thing is, is like suffering, no matter the temporal, like lo- locality of it does matter equally right if we if we assume that as a premise and then also throw into it the fact that like there's there's just a magnitude of difference here um if not several like several magnitudes of difference in potential amounts of suffering between earth-based you know and and galactic so like which yeah how do you make sense of those two yeah this is something that i uh, really uh, also feel a bit unsure about it myself because i i'm not sure how how plausible or likely I find those scenarios that involve large scale colonization. But as mm. you're pointing out, there is this difference of many orders of magnitude. So even if they're not super likely, um, it's arguably still worth focusing on, on those scenarios that, that do involve large, uh, large scale um, space colonization and therefore larger quantities of, of suffering too. Um, so there, there's, there is a tension there, which, you know, to be perfectly honest, I'm, I'm not entirely sure how to resolve that. Myself, it's also worth noting that even on Earth, the quantity of suffering could become very, very large, uh, depending mm. on you know what sort of future technologies you might have available. If you can uh, create uh, like some sort of simulations on computer chips, it might uh, you, you might be able to have a, a very large number of beings in a, in a very small uh, physical mm. space or something like that. Well, this sounds very sci-fi, so uh, I don't know. Um, they are very difficult and unresolved questions there, I think. When it comes um, there's to also the, uh, actually, oh, a, a question that I also find quite intriguing is like the motivation for colonizing space and what exactly would that even be? Um, yeah. Because it's quite funny that like, you know, Musk or someone, someone like Elon Musk, uh, he just makes that his life mission to, to go to Mars. Well, I mean, why exactly, you know? Uh, why is that so um, fascinating? Um, we we have plenty of, of, of space here on Earth. So what, what exactly would be a reason to to go to, to other planets? Now, people can say that it's because of extinction. Uh, but actually, I'm not sure if this is so convincing because, like, why not do a bunker or underground base somewhere in, an Ar- in Antarctica or something? Yeah, um, yeah. That's... You know, Antarctica is not a very hospitable place, but, you know, still much better than Mars because Mars doesn't have <laughs> sphere and, like, different gravity and all that. So, I mean, why would you want to go there? Um, we're very far away from, you know, running out of uh, available land on Earth. So it's, it's yeah, most certainly. Uh, but, like, on the other hand, who knows what might happen in the future? Yeah, and, like, that's, like, that's one big question. It's, like, uh, in terms of... Uh, I mean, one one important uh, s- a stipulation to make is, uh, of course, like historically, one of the main ways that people were afraid and predominantly like Western thinkers, especially in the UK, were afraid that the world was going to end um, was like, you know, fast overpopulation, right? Like Malthus, right? Um, and Malthusian thought. 
uh, which you know now we're realizing that populations tend to uh, begin declining over time. The average like fertility rate goes down massively, or not for fertility, uh, re- like a uh, birth rate. I mean, uh, and also fun fact: yesterday was the day that humanity surpassed eight billion people. So we're now in an eight billion uh-huh. people world. Um, so this is the first twenty first talks episode that has you know potentially eight billion listeners. Hopefully one day. Didn't uh, <laughs> yeah, no, it's 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 really wild. Uh, so. We have certain projections that can inform us about the world, right? For example, population. We know that population probably is going to cap out later this century. And we say probably with asterisks because good science and all that, you know, fun stuff. The question is, is what is the relationship between your work and like quantitative scientific analyses of like future projections because pr- projecting the future is extremely challenging and really hard to get right. Um, and because we're talking about things that are of such a large magnitude, uh, it's still worth talking about to some degree. Right. And, and in my opinion, it's very much so worth talking about. Um, so when it comes to these sort of like calibrated scientific inquiries, are there any that uh, you feel like you especially look towards for guidance about like, you know, the most probable outcomes of like what the world might look like in 50 years? Or um, is this technological, uh, you know, advancement discussion specifically, or space fairing conversation? Are these conversations that are so that have so many unknown unknowns, that it's like, it's harder to incorporate like science today into those discussions? Like, where's the line between speculation and science, you know? Yeah, I mean, this, this is an interesting uh, question, yeah. So I would say that, you know, where possible, of course, one should draw on, uh, you know, hard science and empirical evidence. But as you're saying, um, if we're talking about those larger scenarios that involve possibly artificial intelligence or large-scale space colonization and all that, well, I mean, of course, that would sort of break all the existing trends. I mean, of course, I suppose yeah. in that case, the like fertility rates and population trends that doesn't really apply anymore. Um, I tend to be like a a believer in, in like uh, trends to continue if they're well established. So I, I I would say that I I don't find it very likely that, that those population trends are suddenly going to like reverse because, you know, uh, I mean, there are those scenarios, they they sound wild for a reason, you know, maybe they are actually unlikely. Maybe it is actually unlikely that we're going to somehow develop AI in the middle of the century, and then that that will you know radically change everything. It, mm-hmm. But then that you know contrasts with the point that that we had earlier about how there might be the stakes might just be much much larger in those scenarios, which is why they are worth uh, thinking about and discussing, even if they they might sound far fetched at first. Yeah. Yeah, most, most certainly. Because I mean, thinking about ways that people could imagine suffering taking shape and form, if they were thinking about it 500 years ago, or 1000 years ago, or even, you know, 50 years ago, uh, to make it a little bit more, uh, you know, close to home, we probably it probably would have been challenging to conceive of uh, the context under which like the mo- some of the most suffering happens uh, today, um, in the sense of like the the institutional structures or uh, sort of uh, the the sort of large larger scale structures that um, like lead to them, for example, not necessarily the pain itself, right? Like, I don't really think pain changes that much, or really hasn't changed that much until perhaps like neurological editing becomes like a you know a more uh, <laughs> a more weekly task for people. Um, but you know, for right now, pain tends to look like pain. Um, at least historically, it's remained somewhat consistent um, with some increases in perhaps like psychological emphasis and things like that. Um, however, imagining what pain is like in the future has this much different uh you know veneer and shine to it because of the fact that it might be a type of thing that we can't even conceive of right now right we're talking about potential like situations where messing with someone's fabric of reality not just not in terms of like the literal like material world around them but their brain's perception of it that's not necessarily like out of question in the future right that's i think that's a really scary interesting part of this yeah, I mean, I agree. And then the question is, of course, how do we handle this this uncertainty about the future? Okay, if there are so many unknowns and if, if we don't quite know what's going to happen, um, how are we then to, to reduce asterisks? And like, this is what I'm trying to do in the third part uh, of the book when I, when I look at risk factors. Um, so trying to determine broad factors that 
um, even if I don't really know about the exact outcomes or how asterisks can come about, uh, where like I can maybe say with some robustness that, for instance, a world with fewer conflicts and less uh, polarization, less hostility is less likely to result in in asterisks. So uh, this concept is, is, is uh, I think it also it originates in medicine, where like you can't like spe specifically predict uh if you look at an individual person, you can't specifically say how obesity or a lack of exercise is going to play out in terms of morbidity of that person or something like that. But you can establish this statistical um, relationship. And so you can say, we can say with very high confidence that obesity is a risk factor for earlier death and all sorts of adverse health outcomes. And so you mm. can, despite not knowing anything about an individual's, you know, health trajectory, so to speak, you can say with high robustness that it's it's a good idea to get regular exercise and so on. Um, mm. And similar things I'm trying to identify for for reducing asterisks in the future. What what are some of those general trends? In addition, you already mentioned war uh, as well as societal. Do you mention uh, just war? Or was there another one on that list as well? Uh, I was talking about you know conflicts and and uh, hostility uh, in general Are the, which yeah. includes war i mean i definitely think that you know in 2022 the world does not appear to have improved in that uh, dimension and so that, that is quite yeah. worrying so this possibility of like a major war in in the future like an even more especially major in war. terms of so I, I'm curious. So, what are what are some of the other um, general trends there, uh, or perhaps like sort of general uh, relationships that we can kind of deduce may lead to increased risk of of X uh, or sorry S risks? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. And another one that um, there's a there's a post by David Althaus and me on the risks posed by malevolent actors. So individuals with malevolent personality traits, like uh, well known dictators in the 20th century, Hitler, Stalin, Mao. Um, so there's like uh, a scientific concept there called the, the dark tetrad, which is like consists of four uh, personality traits, um, psychopathy, Machiavellianism, narcissism, and sadism, and that uh, th those people tend to have. And like, uh, obviously, if people with those personality traits are in positions of power, then they can cause uh, great amounts of, of suffering as we've seen in play out in history. Um, yeah. And so what was, what was the name, the coupling of the, like the grouping of the characters of the psychological characteristics? What was the name of it? Dark Tetrad. Dark te Tetrad. Okay. Dark Tetrad. That's, that's so. Yeah. Uh, like, wait, actually, also, sorry. Like, because it's four things. That's why it's called the dark Tetrad. Oh, that makes, okay. That makes much more sense then. Okay. Yeah. Sweet. Uh, that's so interesting. I've not heard. I've not heard of this before. I, I've generally, you know, my thinking about people being bad in history has been reduced just to sociopathy and narcissism. So this is a, a really interesting, uh, 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 like grouping of them together. But yeah, please, yeah. please go and, on. And the yeah. Thing, the reason why it, it makes sense to to refer to this as the dark tetrad is that those traits are correlated. So so the people who um, are, are sadistic also tend to be more na narcissistic and so on. So that there's research on that. Um, and I don't claim to be an expert on it, but um, that's why this is a, a quite coherent concept. And then, of course, the question is, how do, what, what can actually be done to um, prevent those people from rising to positions of power? Or, mm. and that's perhaps just as important, to, to, to keep them in check if they do, you know, which is actually... I mean, I, I don't claim that this is a novel idea that I've had. Isn't this sort of what all the enlightenment thinkers writing about rule of law and democracy and, and division of power and all that, isn't that what it's all about, you know, to, to prevent the damage that, that, that is done if you have like a bad person in, as your president or something. Um, mm. At least that's so one side. Have, yeah. Oh, yeah. What, what, what do you mean that's one side of it? Like, uh, at least that's one side of the conversation that's happened so far? I mean, democracy can also be uh, important for, for other reasons. Uh, like, <laughs> I mean, you can have... Uh, a malevolent person in charge, but you can also, for instance, have a, a king or something that is simply incompetent or so. That, that that's also not good. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> this is this is a quick side question. I'm just curious <laughs> to see what you think. Do you think historically more suffering has been caused from malevolence or from incompetence? 
Um, that's a difficult question because it can be quite difficult to, to disentangle. Um, Absolutely. Even with this concept of malevolence, it's, uh, it's also difficult to disentangle. Like if you look at Nazi Germany, how much of that was like because of Hitler's personality traits versus like broader societal trends that enabled this, you know? So this is, mm. uh, this, this can be hard to disentangle. I, I think in the case of uh, j- just to like zoom into the specific um, case of Nazi Germany, it seems that one of the largest components of that was uh, not like like Germany was one of the less anti-Semitic states um, in in Europe in the time at the time. It had a particularly high Berlin had a very very high population um, of of Jewish folks, um, and that's one that I think one of the reasons why when. Uh, the Nazi regime was built so strongly and the sort of uh, political culture was built so strongly off of this hyper aggressive um, like fascism that was highly anti-Semitic. That's one of the reasons it caught on so quickly was that uh, the like anti-Semitism was like might have been there more subtly like culturally and and more explicitly in other ways. Right. Um, I'm not saying it wasn't anti-Semitic whatsoever because by today's standards, of course it was um, pre like, you know, like during the Weimar Republic and stuff. Um, But at least that was not a trend that looked like it was going to go the way it did until it took a highly, highly bad actor to go in and influence and twist the public in a certain way to try to get a certain political end. Um, so it's, it's like, it does kind of like this, this idea of like the sort of like, uh, uh, like, uh, you know, significant figure version of history, right. Versus the trends uh, approach to understanding history. Uh, I think that like, there is definitely a case for that discussion. Um, in a way that like might be kind of a counterweight to a lot of folks today who are much more like many people will lean more towards on the sort of trends approach to history, right? Which I, I think does account for other things, but like a single bad actor who's especially like good at manipulating people is a extremely massive potential like uh, d- hazard to people suffering and, and, and flourishing. Yeah, um, definitely. I mean, th- those factors, they, they can all be, be related. Like, I mean, I think one of the reasons that made it more likely for Hitler to rise to power is that society had been very polarized uh, at that mm-hmm. point already in politics, like in, in the 30s in, in Germany. And then there's the global economic crisis and so on. But like, I mean, okay, th- this is not a history seminar. So let's maybe leave it. <laughs> it's an interesting As, discussion. Yeah. Oh, yeah, um, most, most certainly. Uh, I can also so talk how- a bit about um, th- these ideas relating to parliamentarism, for instance, um, which I think could it relates to to malevolence in that having a parliamentary system of government of governance uh, probably is better at keeping a malevolent leader in check yeah mm. um, that's also what I alluded to earlier with like a lot of the, the stuff that the, that enlightenment thinkers were talking about is like how to rein in those excesses of power if mm. if your leader is accountable to a parliament you know that that means that they're more accountable to others than if they're a president and have basically been elected for four years and you know can do whatever they want uh, within certain mm. constraints of course but um yeah this is uh, there's uh, there's this book by tiago dos santos why not parliamentarism where he outlines many advantages of parliamentary democracies uh, over presidential mm. democracies so i mean actually yeah. i'm not sure if i need to explain those terms I mean, you, you can, if you want to, um, uh, actually that would, uh, that potentially could be, could be really useful for some folks. So, um, if, if, if you want to define, um, th- those that could be, that could be wonderful. Yeah. So in a, a parliamentary system, uh, basically uh, the, the voters vote, uh, elect a parliament and then that parliament elects the, the head of government, uh, which is usually then called a prime minister or something like that. Whereas in a presidential system, people directly elect the president. So the U.S. is a presidential system, whereas in Europe, most democracies are uh, parliamentary systems. Mm. Um, are there very strong connections to the resilience model and systemic risk model for uh, as like a view of societal unease or societal collapse? Um are there any like strong connection between that and and the work that you're doing with S risk work? Because it seems like societal stability and this resilience model fits really nicely in with this question of of S risks. Uh, I'm I'm not so familiar with with this model. Uh, oh yeah, so about. so it's a it's a model I think initially uh, proposed within 
areas of um, like disaster anthropology, which is really interesting, but it's it's been more and more integrated within uh, X risk thought, uh, especially at Cambridge, um, as well as there's a couple curriculums now, um, like one of the ones that we do uh, for Cornell effective altruism is a curriculum um, written by uh, a friend of mine at Cambridge, who's a researcher on societal collapse, uh, and uh, then also co-created by me. Uh, and really the this like sort of uh, set of ideas relate to this concept that societies are inevitably going to have issues that they face that like people at any given time won't really be able to predict really well. And because the issue of unknown unknowns, one of the best way to do ethical good uh, and to maximize that, you know, that, that work and process is not just to like tackle hazards directly uh, in the case of X central hazards. Um, it is to build a more resilient system as a whole that can take certain shocks to it without collapsing. Um, because, you know, of course, as we saw with like COVID-19, Right now, there's a lot of parts of the network that make up important functions of our society uh, that have unexpected shocks or given unexpected shocks, for example, like a pandemic uh, or a sketchy presidential uh, like a, a campaign or something uh, that there are ramifications in that system that can't like literally cannot be like uh, computed beforehand or predicted beforehand because of interconnectedness um, and a lack of like fail safes and a lack of redundancy within certain societal systems. So the idea is you build a more cohesive and resilient uh, society as a whole um, and with more redundancies and that can lead to higher or increased societal stability, um, which seems like a really important thing here because uh, perhaps societal collapse, like wouldn't it be like the word, like it wouldn't be quite literally like the worst case scenario, which is a really weird thing to say, but in the sense of like S risks that remains like true because S risks seem very contingent on a higher capacity of some group or population. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, yeah. Oftentimes that higher capacity thing seems to increase the potential to do harm. Um, but nonetheless, like this resilience model still seems to fit into the S risk model pretty, pretty nicely. Um, although it might just mean that like you're building a more resilient system that then can support like someone taking advantage of it and like keep them up and, you know, more, uh, I don't know, in, in power for longer or something in the case of like a malevolent, like malevolent dictator or something. So like, how, how do you think about resiliency in this, in this context? Yeah. I mean, I, I think this is complicated because not every, uh, collapse would necessarily entail vast quantities. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah as you were alluding to. So those, those are somewhat different things, although I think there are still some notions of resilience that um, would ap apply from an asterisk lens too. Um, so, I mean, maybe uh, if society is just, you know, if, if people are relatively sane and have some sort of safeguards against things going very badly, then that, that's, I mean, it's obviously talking in very broad terms. What exactly does that even mean? Yeah. Um, yeah. But um, if people are resilient in that sense against some sort of political, you know, political catastrophe or so, so something like uh, Hitler rising to power, if society is resilient to that, that's obviously very good from an asterisk perspective. Um, mm. And it, it's probably going to be quite correlated to um, resilience against other sorts of collapse or other sorts of bad outcomes um, insofar as mm. people think that, you know, avoiding scenarios with vast quantities of suffering is like important. And those other bad outcomes are, are worth avoiding as well, like extinction or something like that. Then of course, you know, resilience uh, would probably help prevent both. Although it's quite, it's quite difficult to say, um, like we'd have to discuss more specifically what, what this resilience refers to and it is worth mm. uh, keeping in mind that those different goals are, are still not the same so um, yeah i don't know if that if that answer helps no no that that most certainly does so uh talk to me a little bit about the conception of eccentral risks versus s risks right because they they are fit into two different categories but both pertain to doing good uh and ideally doing the most good in this case with s risks uh stopping the worst bad from happening of course uh so how do you how do you make sense of that um so yeah i i would uh, consider them to be different things so th there are some scenarios that are 
as risks, but not X risks. There are some scenarios that are X risks, but not, not S risks. There are some that are both and there are some that are, that are neither. Um, mm. So, I mean, for instance, the, the malevolent dictator scenario can be both an S risk and an X risk in the sense of like X risk in the sense of like uh, curtailing humanity's potential. Mm -hmm. um, uh, then there are also scenarios like things could also be an S risk, for instance, something like factory farming, but on a larger scale in the future um, would cause a lot of suffering, but it causes that suffering to animals or like, I mean, the same could be true in like scenarios that involve digital mines. Um, and so that doesn't lead necessarily, it doesn't necessarily lead to, to human extinction or like anything, any sort of collapse or catastrophe in a, in a conventional sense. It, 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 it would be a, a moral catastrophe, obviously mm. in an asterisk, but not an asterisk. Um, mm. And conversely, like if, if, you know, the entire world is just blown up tomorrow, then that would be an X risk, but not an asterisk because it wouldn't involve vast quantities of suffering other than, you know, immediately, but in the longer term, it wouldn't because so, nothing would be brought. So the, uh, sort of the, the inherent kind of, uh, structure of utilitarian thought, right? And this moral calculus question of, um, weighing good positively and bad negatively and using that to then be able to do like Bayesian estimates on probabilities and all those things to then deduce like the, you know, the way to maximize the amount of good and minimize the amount of bad because of this problem and minimizing the amount of bad and what seems to be a massive potential amount of, of future bad that could happen it seems like the calculations on well-being, I'm trying really hard to formulate this the best I can, most precisely I can. It seems like given the sort of utilitarian basis um, that S risks, since they cause such a massive amount of suffering, that some S risk pro prioritization uh, might on paper at least appear to be more important than stopping human extinction if it's just a quick like lights out for humanity, no suffering scenario just because of like such a mass amount of suffering. And that seems counter, like that doesn't seem quite right to me when it, it doesn't pass the gut check, you know? However, I think if you ask most people, hey, would you prefer a, a universe where there's a trillion people or a billion people or beings like suffering constantly for the end of time versus one where there's like, you know, lights are out and, you know, no one's home. It seems like people would pick the latter of the two. But I just like, yeah, I, I was I was just really curious about this because I was thinking about it. Um, yeah, I mean, this, this raises some rather thorny philosophical uh, questions relating to uh, the field that's called uh, population ethics. Um, and there, there's also lots of writings, on, for instance, on the website of the Center for Reducing Suffering on, on that topic. We tend to, you know, as the name suggests, we tend to think that the reduction of, of suffering should be our primary uh, moral goal. And that's not quite the same as, as preventing uh, extinction. Now, of I course, mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course, lots of arguments can be made um, both ways in this discussion. Um, I'm not sure if we have, you know, much time to go into detail, but um, so many people, for instance, like to, to just um, motivate this this idea that suffering should be a top priority. Um, many people, many thinkers have alluded to the unique badness of, of severe forms of suffering in particular mm. that can't so easily be outweighed by some sort of happiness or positive good. Um, yeah. Another intuition that, that many people have uh, and, and that I also personally share is that it's uh, not important to bring happy beings into existence, but uh, it is important to ensure that those who do exist uh, don't suffer. Um, so that's like this famous line by Narvison, uh, make people happy, not happy people or something like that. Um, mm. yeah, but I mean, I guess we don't really have uh, time to go into a lot of detail on that. As I'm saying, these are like very, very complicated philosophical, que philosophical questions that are like, you know, books, papers, and articles have been written about it. Um, mm. but if we pick one of those and, and dive a little bit more closely into the, the philosophical uh, thinking there, uh, do you want to, to speak more about the, the last of the three that you just listed, this sense of, of um, the importance of, of making happier people, or sorry, of, of um, making people happy, not happier people? And, and, and why, like, is it, because you said it's a, it, you share the intuition, um, but also, of course, have thought extensively about it. So, so what are some of the potential 
um, like counter arguments to that um, and effective responses? Um, yeah, I mean, if you just, uh, if you have this a button in front of you and it, it creates uh, one person that is being tortured and two people that experience like very intense happiness uh, of some sort, then, you know, to me personally, it feels obvious that you should not do that and that it would be terrible to press that button. But like, yeah. I, I do appreciate yeah. that, you know, people have different um, intuitions about this stuff and, and very different opinions. So, you know, mm. from my point of view, this feels intuitively quite clear, but um, you mentioned like counter arguments. There's, there's um, some quite fancy philosophical arguments relating to the, the non-identity uh, problem and like various inconsistencies yeah. that you're trying, that you're going to get and impossibility theorems when you're trying to make this into a coherent philosophical view. Um, I mean, I don't think we really have time to go into that. And I'm also <laughs> not, really, not really an expert on that. Uh, like the reason why I tend to focus on, on suffering is just that this um, aligns more with, with the intuitions that I feel about, you know, what it, mm -hmm. what, what it, what it means to help others and to do good. Um, I appreciate you giving the, the bun example specifically. I think that really clearly illustrates the, the trade-off that uh, we are making when we're picking which path to, to, to work on, right? Um, because it it does seem a lot of flourishing is also like in a more pragmatic sense a lot of flourishing does seem built off of um ah, this is a really weird argument because aristotle would argue that like this is not the case because it wouldn't be true flourishing if it's based off of suffering but it, at least in the modern world a lot of like um pr for example like economic um increases yeah. are built on the backs of of like of, of people suffering doing labor and 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 work so like there there are genuine real world examples of this as well um and so i'm sure that when like diving into this question of s risks uh a universe of x number of people being tortured uh is the worst case scenario possible but the it seems like most likely that the most realistic situations are ones in which there's a mixture of great suffering and yeah, yeah. great well-being exactly. and like so how you weigh suffering matters a lot because of that right um in yeah. whether or not you would see that type of world being worth it yeah, so the, the, the tricky bit here is that, again, like this is both an, a normative and an empirical uh, mm. question. The, the normative bit is like what we discussed so far about how much do I morally, how much weight do I assign to, to suffering versus, versus other priorities. But then there's yeah. also the empirical question of like, you know, how likely are those scenarios, how good or bad is the future on average going to be? And of course, yeah. um, I think some people in the effective altruism community have like, a quite optimistic view of the future where like it, it will be very, very good. Uh, assuming that humanity doesn't go extinct, uh, that, that the future will be bright. <laughs> yeah. um, where, I mean, I'm not saying I endorse uh, a pessimistic view, but like, I think it's at mm. least, you know, very, very unclear, you know, and especially if, if you include non-human animals, uh, and look at you know mm. what happens on factory farms. You know it's 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 not so obvious that things are always getting better, in my opinion. Um, yeah, and that also I think there's a tendency for people who care a lot about animal suffering to uh, also perhaps be be less uh, optimistic about the future and their their assessment of how much happiness and suffering there will be uh, in the future. And then mm. of course, if you, if you think that there will be that, that by default the future will be, will be bright anyway and you know people in the future will avoid all suffering well then of course you will tend to be less concerned about s risks obviously yeah whereas if you're more pessimistic about it then you will be more concerned about s risks so there's like that factor and the normative factor of of like where you stand on those philosophical issues and those two in combinations uh you know determines how much people prioritize s risks versus uh, x risks yeah, because like I, I think that I don't know. It's 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 interesting to think about the potential ramifications of like you know we we start off talking about like wishful thinking, right? Uh, and you know perhaps some some aspect of thinking the future is going to be exclusively bright. Um, at least for me, it could be could be based off some sort of like wishful thinking, right? Like assuming that this project that at least I feel involved in, right? This this, this project of of steadily making things better. Um, and working against and you know uh, helping to uh, to to stop the floodgates from opening 
uh, to to human suffering or in the case of, of of all beings like just any suffering whatsoever um, while trying to build up like a, a you know, a, a, a beautiful like like city on the hill right you know sort of thing of like beauty and art and like uh, greatness and all those sort of things right that that seemed like virtuous virtuous components um it seems that perhaps at least in my own personal calculations i'm not weighing suffering as much as i really should right maybe maybe there is in in the way that your intuition uh and sort of like root like moral psych is like leading you towards emphasis on suffering and mitigating suffering um quite nobly uh in mine i i might not have been led to the same emphasis there and it seems like our community of of ea folks like need people with these differing intuitions right it's a very very strong case for diversity of intuition um because this those moral intuitions do motivate behavior um and 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 thoughts and stuff quite quite strongly it seems yeah i mean i i completely agree and i think it it can be very healthy to have a, a diversity of of perspectives on this, and I mean, as I was saying, people have different uh, intuitions and different views on those philosophical uh, issues, and and that's perfectly fine. Um, you know, we should yeah. just try to um, find common ground and and uh, try to find things that are robust from many different perspectives. Um, Most certainly, yeah, uh, absolutely. So, how uh, I, I'm curious, how do these suffering risks correspond to advancements in artificial intelligence technology? Yeah, that, that's um, a great question. So I would say that about advancements in AI or, or any other technology, just generally, it has the effect of raising the stakes, right? Um, as humanity becomes more powerful, um, there's more of a chance for things to go well, but also more of a chance for things to go badly. Like this is obviously very broadly speaking but insofar as it raises the stakes it it can also uh, pose an asterisk and so artificial intelligence if, if it is uh like if those scenarios that effective altruists tend to talk about about like very transformative and very powerful artificial intelligence if this comes about um then that would could potentially be a source of asterisk although i mean it's worth noting that first of all like the plausibility or likelihood of those scenarios is like yet another question and then mm. uh Secondly, it's also worth noting that it could also prevent S risks from potential other sources or possibly even, you know, alien civilizations or whatever. Um, so um, there's a lot of complicated uh, considerations there. But mm. basically, I think that the, the primary aspect would just be that it raises the stakes in, in both directions if, yeah. if AI is developed. Yeah, so like similar to the sort of uh, political argument of um, increased state capacity, right? Um, increased state capacity is great when there's a disaster, but it's not so great when the head of that state is not exactly a great person. Uh, so it, it has the a, a very similar tinge to this. Um, I think it's a Fukuyama argument initially, actually, or maybe not initially, but one of the main propagators of it today. Um, that's super interesting. Okay, what other? So like, what are the questions that when writing the book, you were the most eager to talk about? And, and, and what do you think are the things that like when you're like, give me the cocktail uh, party, like breakdown of, of, of S risks, right? Of what about this question both is so intriguing for you, but also do you think that uh, people outside of the EA community, for example, um, or perhaps proto EAs uh, would, would really find in, important or, or, or intriguing? Because I feel like there's a lot there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I'm not sure if, like, as I was saying, the topic might not be maximally suitable for a sort of cocktail party. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what cocktail parties are you going to? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would just uh, go with the, like, the basics of how, you know, the, those scenarios could be really, really bad. And like, it, it seems worth thinking about that. We like the irony mm -hmm. is that we have all this dystopian science fiction and uh, the Black Mirror episodes and so on. Yeah. But like, yeah. who is actually, you know, seriously thinking about uh, what could happen and what could be done now to make it less likely that, that, that this will happen. And that, that appears mm. to be something that not many people do. And so that, that that's why, you know, we need more of it. 
Yeah, no, I, I, I most certainly agree with that. Um, so I, we've already talked a bit about this, this concept of, of politics and its relationship with S risks. Uh, and as well as this, uh, connectedly, uh, the potential for conflicts to also be a very large connected factor here. Um, are there other specific things um, that we see as like potentially corresponding with increased risks of S risks uh, or increased like propensity or chance of them um, beyond politics and conflict? What, what, what are some of the other factors there? Um, I mean, technology is one of the other factors. That oh, of I... course, my, my mistake. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, just think, yeah. Just more technological capacity uh, that you know raises the stakes in both directions. That's um, one of the other factors. Uh, what more is there? There's uh, something else that I've forgotten. I mean, space colonization is is another one. Um, so increase like material, like potential. Yeah. That, that just sort of expands human civilization. I mean, it's kind of related to, to having more advanced technology, right? Because yeah, presumably it's a technology that, that allows you to uh, colonize space. I mean, it, it seems a bit weird to um, disconnect the imagine two. scenarios where, you know, we don't have good technology, but we're somehow colonizing all of space. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We just have like little tin cans that we like fit a few people into at a time and shoot around the universe, hoping that a couple yeah. of them make it. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's it's, some, it's not uh, simple, you know, because who knows what technological trends will be like. It, it is conceivable yeah. that we don't develop uh, any fancy artificial intelligence, uh, but we do um, have better spaceships. I mean, what do I know? <laughs> um, I think the, yeah, the future yeah, of artificial right. intelligence is like a quite complicated topic. Uh, I mean, I don't know if we have time for that in, in this podcast. Um, I think uh, it's worth thinking about possible scenarios involving artificial intelligence and might be a very transformative technology, but I'm mm. somewhat you know, reluctant to like fully endorse the sorts of narratives that, that exist in, in the effective altruism community, which t um, at least historically have, I think have tended to be maybe a bit too simplistic about you have you have this AI and then then it suddenly takes over the world. I think this will probably mm. be more more gradual, more more distributed, more like maybe in the sense in which the internet or industrialization or so took over the world, which is like mm. not quite the same thing as like you have a thing in a basement and then it controls the, the world or something like that. Do you see that um, as not leaning into the transformative AI? I mean, it, it's not the transformative AI like standard narrative within like, EA or, or the rationality community, but is that, do you, do you still see that as being something that would be potentially transformative or, and you just have increased time scales or increased implementation scales for it? Or is it, you are no, it's, suspicious about the central claim that AI will be transformative? Uh, both it, is fine. I'd like to add, but I, I'm just curious. I mean, it is a bit of both. Uh, I mean, in the scenario that I outlined, it would still, it can still be transformative just like, I mean, in, the internet. In the, yeah. <laughs> It has also been uh, transformative. The point is just that there, there wasn't necessarily like a single point where you necessarily could have influenced this in a very easy or, or easy to predict way. Like if you're in the year 1800 and even if you correctly realize that there's like something very groundbreaking going on. I don't know if people in, in the year 1800 realized that, but even if you do, I mean, what exactly are you going to do about it? It might still be mm. that the best thing to do it might still be, despite the fact that those technological developments are really crucial, it might still be that the most effective thing to do is to uh, raise concerns for animal welfare or like some, some good philosophical or political ideas and, and spread that. Uh, it, it's just not so obvious. So the, the point is that those different models of the future of artificial intelligence, the point is not so much that it's not going to be an important technology. The point is that mm. the implications for how we can shape it and like how directly we should focus on shaping AI are are different. Yeah, that, that's very that's worth, very important. For what, for what it's worth, um, maybe one should also question whether it is actually going to be uh, this pivotal. Um, I mean, if I look at the world over the last few years, it, it, it does not appear that, that our major problems have that much to do with, with artificial intelligence. And like, there is certainly uh, progress on, on language models and so on, but so far it doesn't seem world-changing to me. 
So, I mean, that would be another one of those things where like you have trends and like, but then you're discussing scenarios where that trend suddenly changes completely. Um, but the trends that I yeah. see, if I just extrapolate what I'm seeing in terms of AI over the last years and decades, I mean, I'm not saying it's not a useful technology. It definitely is. I'm not saying it's not going to have some impact, but um, it, yeah, it's not necessarily world changing uh, or at least not over, not in like an immediate uh, sense. Um, mm. Mm. Yeah. I'm that, curious to get your thoughts on that. Yeah. <laughs> so I generally like uh, when I, when I started initially getting into uh, accidental risk, um, which I got into before I was exposed more so to effective altruism. Um, I, I was really much so like on the fence um, when it came to like AI, transformative AI specifically. Uh, I'm now convinced that I, I think that if artificial general intelligence comes about, it is a very, very high likelihood or there is a very high likelihood um, of it being unaligned and human extinction like falling from that. Um, however, I am I'm very, very unsure about the uh, timelines uh, being like accurate or inaccurate, um, especially the ones that uh, I'm reading largely right now um, and, and had to read as a part of the um, alignment like research that I did over the, this last summer here at Cornell <clears throat> um, with Cornell's AI safety, long-term AI safety lab. I think AI will continue to be quite like a lowercase t transformative in the sense of like in the way that like the internet was, for example. Um, I think that's going to continue to happen just looking at the increase in natural language uh, programs in the last like 10 years. I think that's going to continue to get substantially better and more refined. Uh, and I think that that's already having massive ramifications in the world in ways that like we are not making sense of yet fully, you know? Uh, so that time lag in terms of like people's concept, like people's understanding of trends and forces happening today and affecting the world today, that time lag, um, you know, just like the the new, like how long it takes the New York Times to write like a compelling scientific art, like like uh, you know article explaining a, a concept or something, um, or a trend. Um, we can call it the the New York Times time lag, right? Uh, that is something I'm especially interested in right now. Right. Because I think given what we'll be talking about in two years from now or five years from now about what 2022 was like in relation to um, these this increase in natural language um, program like power uh, and this you know sort of subset of artificial narrow intelligence that's just gone explosively better. I think with some time we'll be able to look back and say, OK, this is like this is how much it was actually influencing stuff then. Um, and that will be able to help us increase our estimates of of where we might be going. And I think after that point, my certainty uh, and level of confidence for that 20 to 50 year mark of how likely is AGI in this timeline, um, I think that will probably go up. Um, but of course, that's largely going to be predicated off of experts, if that makes sense. I just said a whole lot of words, but yeah, I hope I hope that yeah, made no, some. That's fine. I mean, it, it was a very uh, complicated question. And like the, that question of the, the timelines is like... Um... This is an additional question that, that is, uh, I mean, related, but still distinct yeah. from the question of like what that transition would look like and how likely it is to happen in the first place and so on and how Most transformative certainly. it would be. Um, so there, there, this is what makes those topics uh, difficult is that there, there are so many different uh, dimensions uh, to them. And, uh, and yeah. it's also what makes them fun to some degree, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, what I would, awesome. what I would maybe say is that those uh, surveys among experts, um, I'm not sure if I would really put too much faith in this sort of methodology. Um, mm. I mean, isn't there? Why is this, that? This, um, I mean, I just don't know if like this, this, this is not the sort of question where you get like good feedback loops, right? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, why would you necessarily expect the average uh, researcher in this field to have um, like well calibrated views on this, um, like especially if you're looking mm -hmm. like more further out um, predictions and things that involve like maybe more speculative, like AGI scenarios. Um, if you're asking people like in how many years is a machine learning system going to be able to play play Go at this and that level, then you you uh, might get a a reasonable answer to that. But like uh, 
Well, actually, Go was like an example. Where yeah, I was going to say, like, it's, it's interesting because with AI, it's always beat our estimates. Like, historically, like, the, the only precedent is us, un, like, like, not anticipating it quick enough. Um, I, I would maybe challenge that a little bit. I mean, I haven't okay. looked in so much detail into the, the entire Go predictions. Um, but so the, the thing that's worth noting about that is that before uh, um, DeepMind and AlphaGo came along, uh, go playing AIs were just like you know people doing that for a hobby uh, somewhere or like academics with like a very low budget uh, coding up something, and then of course that's a, a completely different thing to like a well resourced uh, company with like millions of dollars to spend on like training the system. <laughs> of course, of course that accelerates progress a lot. I mean, of course it does. Yeah, that doesn't necessarily yeah. <laughs> prove anything about the. And then of course that means that the predictions that were based on like continuing that trend were. were were wrong, but um, I mean, this doesn't necessarily prove much about the uh, more broader point. Um, I think there has been a, a track record also of like over optimism in in the field of AI, uh, which then then leads to like the, the so called AI winters. Um, yeah, so- I yeah, I, I'm I'm thinking of the. I'm thinking of the uh, the Dartmouth summer, right? Where initially the first uh, machine learning like conversations, uh, like like really really began to kick off. I I forget what year it was. I it was I for some reason I want to say fifty four or sixty four, but I like cannot get quote on that. Um, so listeners, please fact check this. Um, but what I know is true about the cir- circumstance is the group of researchers met at Dartmouth College uh, to discuss like what like what they could get done in relationship to um, artificial intelligence, and they had like three different goals um, for that. And they thought by the end of the summer, for example, the third goal I think was being able to perform like just natural language, like just like like be able to talk with it and have it like talk back somewhat. And they were like, yeah, we'll we'll give that nine weeks. We'll give that six to nine weeks. Of course, and it took you know it took humanity like close to, to fifty years, sixty years, right? Um, mm-hmm. So, I I do definitely uh, see the hubris in, in the statement earlier that um, AI predictions usually are under anticipations. Um, however, uh, I think that a part of that intuition that I had was informed by the sort of sense that like. Perhaps it wasn't the experts who were necessarily surprised by AlphaGo, but the um, at least in the case of, of DeepMind and AlphaGo, uh, like seeing it play a game that humanity has been playing for you know fifty five hundred years and discovering new moves, you know after like not as much training time as you would expect, uh, that I think is impressive to any anyone listening and and, and surprising I think to 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 ninety nine point nine percent of the population right. Um, even if there are experts who, who could have anticipated it. I mean, I definitely am a fan of AlphaGo and I, I've watched uh, th- those games and the, the infamous Move 37 of, of Game 2 or what it, what, it, what it was. So yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely a, a great achievement. I mean, I don't want to downplay that. Um, oh, I'm yeah. just saying that like, if we're talking about uh, things that we might want to focus on in our altruistic efforts, we sort of need something more world-changing than, than you know playing board games. I would say, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I that that does seem quite quite reasonable. Yeah, you don't hear many people talking about transformative uh, AI board game players. Uh, yeah, I feel like that's uh, I, I feel like that's like less of the uh, I mean, the initial. Of course, goal. I mean this is maybe a little bit uncharitable because people would of course oh, say okay, that yeah. successes in those board games are indicative of the, like the, the broader intellectual. Uh, capabilities of those systems but which okay. i do i do buy that argument given i think the the computational complexity i think of, of a game like go especially in terms of its ability to like, like i i think the whatever secret sauce of <laughs> of um uh enforcement learning uh re- reinforcement learning that AlphaGo was able to kind of uh, uh you know, like instill in their program that secret sauce. I, I think the the real interesting part for it for me, apart from just like watching it and like you know, like like we get from watching anything that's really good at what it's doing, do that thing. Uh, beyond just that sort of like animalistic, like oh wow, that thing is good at this game we like to play. Uh, beyond that, the fact that it learned it so quickly is what I think is so so deeply intriguing to me. Um, and that that quickness with how it learned it is 
insane, especially when you look at um, the second uh, iteration of it. Um, I'm spacing on the, the specific name, um, but where it played um, the version of itself. Alpha that, Zero? Uh, is it Alpha Zero that played Alpha Go? There, oh, there's I, one that I, played I, an I, earlier iteration of itself and then became better. Like it beat its it beat its earlier iteration like a hundred times to zero. Um, and the iteration that had lost that hundred times in a row was the one that had beaten the world champion um, player at the game. Oh yeah, yeah, I think something like that happened, but I, I don't recall the the very uh, exact history. Uh, when you're saying that it learned it fast, um, I'm not sure what exactly that refers to. Like I think that the number of of games that they they used to train AlphaGo was quite large. Oh um, no, I'm just saying the t- the time scale that it, like the the time it was working at was relatively small. Computationally, it's very very intense, of course. Okay, but yeah. um, yeah, 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 it's 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 the speed that seems kind of counterintuitive, which is this really it, it's a really interesting component of just AI generally, um, or excuse me, of technology generally is uh, it can be really really hard to anticipate. The, the the time horizons that that these things happen at right and in terms of affecting how we think about potential suffering uh it seems like a really significant like like area of inquiry right is this like like how long would it take for us to get to a point where an s like an like a true s risk could uh, a scenario could happen right um like like uh, and like you're saying or like you said earlier for example like people who perhaps are a little bit more sympathetic to um animal causes and cause areas within um yay for example uh might be a bit more pessimistic and say like well i mean there's already a very very massive amount of animal suffering happening today um i don't think that's debated whatsoever um so i i think for 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 like as like a, a question i have for you is what do you think is the shortest amount of time that we might have between now and a a true S risk like scenario coming to fruition? Is it like like are you working on the, the scale of fifty years or a thousand years or like what is like uh, and this is gonna of course be a ballpark and, and uh but yeah I'm just I'm just curious. Yeah, I mean that's an interesting question and that I haven't actually thought so much about. Um but this is maybe a, a point where um, the definition of it becomes a bit tricky because, I mean, are we talking about yeah. the instantiation of the actual suffering or are we talking about, um, you know, events that might happen in the relatively near future uh, that then, you know, down the road lead to a lot of suffering being created? I mean, it's possible that in the mm. next 10 years, um, political discourse on Twitter goes uh, totally insane and then, you know, you, we have a, a dictator uh, rising to power in the U.S., democracy fails, and then that dictator at some point creates a lot of suffering. Uh, I mean, I'm just making up that scenario. Um, <laughs> it's but, a little close to home. It's, it's, I feel like that scenario is not exactly a far. <laughs> the most unlikely thing is him being allowed back on Twitter. Um, and by, by him, I, I'm not trying to polarize a part of my audience, but... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to get into U.S. politics here. <laughs> that there's uh, um, things could go wrong in the relatively near future, but like the suffering might be instantiated much later and at a over a long, a lot a longer time span. So it's um, us getting on the wrong like rail track, for example. Like we we um, get onto a path that might lead to increased chances mm, of um. This, I mean, sort possibly, of like the, yeah. Possibly, although it's it's very non-obvious whether whether or not there is such a thing as like different rail tracks rather than like more gradual evolutions of things. So like, I mean, is it true that there are, I mean, this is also a question that is discussed in long-termism more broadly. It's not only mm. relevant to S-risks. Like, oh, are yeah. there yeah, like lock-in. dependencies or lock-ins somewhere where like you have this one point where you, that is like somehow pivotal and that changes all of history? Or do we have like, I think that's probably in most cases more likely, just like a gradual evolution of things. And that unfortunately makes it less obvious to, to, to know like how you can best influence that system in a better direction. Um, yeah, yeah, it, it does make it certainly less, uh, less able to be, I guess, would you I, say I don't claim steerable? to have it figured out either. <laughs> <laughs> I very rarely claim to have anything figured out, luckily. Um, but yeah, that's, that, that is really, really intriguing to me. Then 
moving on to sort of the the, the questions to wrap up here, um, I'm I'm curious what what keeps you up at night in terms of hazards of you know to 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 dip your toes in uh, existential risk for a little while. Uh, what existential hazards are you the most concerned about? Not in terms of S risk, but just more broadly for society. Um, so on a personal level, I'm not so massively uh, concerned uh, about that, or like it doesn't really keep me up uh, at night. Uh, I'm, I'm sleeping fine most of the really time. Really, I'm, I'm glad like, to hear that. That's um, good to hear. Sorry, <laughs> so I'm glad. I'm glad to hear you're sleeping soundly. As a uh, yeah, it's, it's important for for one's productivity and so on. So uh, yeah, good sleep is definitely to be recommended. Um, yeah, I think on a, uh, there's like, of course, also a lot of discussion in the EA movement around like the likelihood of those um, catastrophic scenarios, like nuclear war and, and major pandemics and so on. Uh, mm. Personally, I don't think that likelihood is so large to to start worrying about it in terms of my own personal, you know, survival or health. Um, mm. Yeah, it doesn't it doesn't quite feel like the house is on fire as of as of now at this point in, in human history. Um, to, to me, it, it doesn't, um, uh, but like, then again, my, my definition of fire would also be different from like, because I'm more focused on asterisks, you know, my, yeah, my definition yeah, of, you know, I mean, I don't know how to make sense of that. In, in that is, yeah, that, that, that's a very but interesting, that, yeah, I mean, I'm because it's more yeah. concerned about the flooding than about the fire or something like that. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, <laughs> if the, if the water is especially, painful on on the feet uh it can be uh yeah. potentially a, a worse a worse case from suffering uh, from suffering standpoint. yeah sorry i'm I wasn't still... able to make that analogy analogy work <laughs> <laughs> it's all good i mean hey we're all it's this is a it's a collaborative uh thinking space so it's all it's all good um uh, but uh but yeah I, I do love a good analogy though so if there's any other good analogies uh that you have in your back pocket let me let me know as as one sort of final wrapping up question uh do you how involved with a sense of like meaning or purpose do you think your work is for you? Does it feel really highly meaningful for you? Um, is, is that sense of meaning or purpose something that motivates you or, or is the motivation? Um, and I'm, I'm talking like b- about that, like visceral sense of motivation, right? Um, it, does that motivation come from, from somewhere else for you? Um, does it, I guess more simply, like does the work feel intrinsically m- motivationally meaningful? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it does. Um, I mean, I guess otherwise I wouldn't be, be doing it. I suppose you got to do something in life. You know, why not uh, try to, to make the world a better place? Um, and I think that the work that I do is is the, the best way to do it. For me personally, I'm not saying that everyone in the world uh, should be working on it in, in this way. Um, people have different strengths and different interests, of course. Um yeah, like the, the question of personal motivation, um, like, uh, is quite different for different people too. Um, for me personally, uh, thinking about this in fairly abstract terms can be enough to like, uh, for like, to motivate myself to do the, the work on a day to day basis. Like, it's mm. not like, um, you're constantly thinking uh, about some very uh, profound philosophical or motivational thing to, to do this sort of work because the day to day, work might be you know not not very different to to the other sorts of of jobs you know writing emails or something or, or giving interviews in a, in a podcast um mm. so it's not like you have to constantly think about um about that that sounds perfect see that that i uh i should note actually that um magnus winding a colleague of mine at, at, at crs uh, like he's, he's planning to, to write a book called compassionate purpose where he he explores those those questions uh, more, and I think he has some interesting thoughts. Oh, really? Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. That's uh, that that yeah, that that's super fascinating. I'll make sure to to reach out to Magnus in that case. Um, hey, he might be able to awesome. tell you a lot more about that. I I don't think I personally have like very interesting uh, thoughts on this this motivational uh, this question of motivation for reducing suffering or for altruistic work. Well, hey, um, you gave you gave the answer I was I was looking for in the sense of. Uh, the, what motivates you, right? And it seems like that we we covered that uh, pretty, like thoroughly, which I I, I do really appreciate. It, it's just it's something that I'm really intrigued by when asking people who 
are involved in EA or X Risk or uh, any other sort of the 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 related communities of intellectuals, um, or just put as simply as possible, like anyone who is dedicating themselves and really just throwing themselves at trying to do the most good they can. Um, I think what motivates those people. And it's going to, of course, like be a wide spectrum of things that motivate, but having the specific examples can help people identify and cultivate that um, in their own lives to some degree. Um, I know it's helped me substantially to be able to talk with people who are who are doing this type of work and say, like, hey, like what motivates you? Oh, OK. And then I can like, you know, think about that, listen to that um, and potentially find similar things in my own life and expand my own um, approach to not just like global, universal, like flourishing. Um or in your case, mitigation and, and reduction of, of suffering, um, but also this sort of approach to personal flourishing, which I do think when individuals are flourishing, they tend to do more good, right? Um, because hurt people hurt true, people. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm also just a big sucker for existential psychology. So, um, what can I what can I say? <laughs> I, I think it, I think it it works really effectively in terms of making a, a very appealing case for doing existential risk work um, and effective altruism work when you can. Like when when you're getting people r- riled up and excited about cultivating a sense of purpose and meaning in terms of like sort of the Viktor Frankl type like you know purpose and 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 and, and meaning um, because I do think meaning motivates um, and at least for me this is quite interesting right for me meaning motivates the sort of in the positive sense motivates action whereas for you it seems mitigating suffering is is deeply deeply motivating as well um, and of course I think that like. I also am motivated by mitigating suffering. Um, but like we talked about earlier, that focus for me is, is definitely on maximizing um, like, like well-being. At least it was before going into this conversation. So thank you so much for helping me to adjust yes. this and calibrate this and, and duke out some ideas. Uh, it most certainly was a, a, like a really fun conversation. So thank you so much. Thanks a lot for having me. Yeah, of course. Of course.